Today, I am talking to John Wood of an organization called Better Angels. And in a second, I'm going to ask him to tell you all what that organization is and what it does. And those who follow my work uh, closely and have followed me for a while are going to work out within just a few sentences uh, why I am so keen to talk to John and to present to you what his organization or what the organization he represents is all about. So with that said, John, welcome to this show. Thanks for giving me some time and uh, you know, sharing with me what I'm all, I know I'm excited to talk to you about. Um, over to you. What's Better Angels? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Robin, for uh, giving me the chance to hang out with you uh, for a minute today. And uh, yeah, I mean, jumping right into it. So Better Angels is America's leading grassroots organization dedicated to the cause of political depolarization. Though I'm pleased to say that there are a number of worthy groups in this space. Um, and uh, what does Better Angels do? Now, Better Angels is known primarily for something that we call a red-blue workshop. So just so you know, we're a national volunteer-driven organization. I happen to be on staff at Better Angels, but very small staff. Uh, we've got, uh, we've got uh, thousands of members across the country, about 1,000 volunteers or so. And we're primarily known for uh, this red and blue workshop model where we bring together small groups of conservatives and liberals, or reds and blues, as we say in-house, and uh, we bring them together in a shared space, not so much to argue or debate politics exactly, but rather to give each side the opportunity to speak from the vantage point of their own personal experience in terms of why they see politics the way they do and you know what in their background has caused them to embrace the perspectives that they have embraced. So the idea is to bring people into a context where they can understand each other uh, beyond the stereotypes and past the political labels. Uh, which obviously, you know, is not the way political dialogue tends to unfold in our conventional sorts of political media environments. So the red and blue workshops tend to be seven hour sessions. Uh, they were actually based upon the principles of family therapy, uh, believe it or not. In fact, they were designed by an individual named Professor William Doherty from the uh, University of Minnesota. Uh, Professor Doherty, colleague of mine, co-founder of Better Angels, is one of America's foremost marriage counselors. So, you know, it's sort of the right skill set to, uh, to bring to our, um, you know, to our political uh, uh, troubles uh, at the moment. And so these experiences have been incredibly impactful uh, for people, uh, conservatives, liberals, Democrats, and Republicans, uh, and others all across the country. And uh, coming out of these workshops, people, you know, they may or may not agree more uh, or less than they did on policy issues uh, coming out of the conversation as they did going into it. But what tends to almost be universally true is that they wind up developing a new sort of personal appreciation uh, for just the, for the, for, for the human being on the other side of the political conversation. We managed to remember that there are all sorts of things that we have in common on the levels of values and experiences that allow us to empathize with each other in a deeper sort of way. And so coming out of these workshops, what a lot of people don't know is that um, Better Angels provides vehicles for people to continue working together and to continue organizing uh, together across the party division on issues in their local community and in, uh, in their states that there may be bipartisan agreement on uh, where they might be able to sort of move, move the ball forward in a local in a local way. So Better Angels is a national organization. You know, we don't endorse candidates. We don't endorse policy positions and so forth. But we set up a framework and a structure whereby people on a grassroots level can work together in their own communities after having been sort of, you know, baptized into a new way of having political conversations. They can take that new conversational and philosophical grounding and apply it to real sorts of political organizing um, on a grassroots level. So we have programs aimed at depolarizing American politics uh, on the grassroots and the community level. Uh, on the academic level, we have a debate program that is meant to foster, um, really sort of foster a culture of freedom, and freedom of speech and viewpoint diversity in college campuses. Um, in the media sphere, uh, I host a podcast with my colleague Kieran O'Connor, former, uh, former uh, Obama and Hillary Clinton communications staffer. I was a Republican nominee for Congress and a party vice chair in Los Angeles myself. And um, we have writers and people who are seeking to model a depolarizing way of communicating politics and political discourse in the digital sphere. 
We have partnerships with other organizations that are taking place. And all of this has happened just really since the uh, 2016 election, you know? So, you know, when you look at the headlines, of course, I mean, America is terribly divided, but when you look at Better Angels and the community that we're building and the work that's taking place with all sorts of other groups and all sorts of other areas, what, you, uh, what people are starting to discover is that there's this vibrant depolarization movement mm -hmm. taking place. And, uh, you know, it, it shows that there is genuine momentum for a real fundamental cultural shift in our civil society that I think will lead us to a place to where we can stabilize uh, our politics and lead us towards a more flourishing democratic society moving forward. I mean, it's, I love hearing you say all that. And before I hit record to begin this show, um, we were talking very briefly and you said something that I said to you confirms my cautious optimism. And you're saying it again here. And I asked you if you were a cautious optimist and you said you were a reckless optimist, which I loved. Um, so I want to just speak a little bit more about that context that we're in. And this, if you like, reaction to the polarization. Um, I've sometimes... Um, kind of try to explain it by saying, look, there's this pendulum and it's kind of, oh, it's, it's close to the extremum of tribalism, of polarization. The reaction that has been latent, the dissatisfaction, the disaffection is now being turned in, um, it's kind of rising in consciousness and being turned into organizations like yours. Mm. Um, and so I, it is my sense, and I think you're confirming it here, that you know, something's maxed out and we may not be at the exact, you know, uh, end of the swing, but we're pretty close to it. And mm -hmm. so, you know, the, the, the cure is already kind of coming up. Um, is that your, is that your feeling? Would you like to say kind of publicly you are a reckless optimist because, um, yeah, I guess what's that, um, What's the law? It's not, is it Herbert Stein's law? Um, if, something, uh, if something can't go on forever, it won't. You know, right. is that in play here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah, well, you know, you've, you've quoted me already, but I'm happy to, happy to own it. Yeah, you know, I am a bit of a reckless, uh, reckless optimist. And um, I, I guess for that reason that you articulate, you know, I, I do think there is something about the evolution of human societies that tends ultimately towards balance because we're motivated by all these different parts of human nature and some of that has to do with you know uh, loyalty to tribe and ego and selfishness and all of these things that cause us to be short-sighted but then I think that there is a longer more sort of virtuous uh, aspect uh, to the to human uh, psychology to the human soul if you will that causes us to quietly and subtly uh, look for areas of cooperation, collaboration, um, and mutual understanding. Mm. And it is those quiet, I think, uh, subtler aspects of the human personality which ensures that over the long arc of history, things do tend to bend in the direction of justice because ultimately, I do think we're self-serving creatures, but I think that part of being self-serving is recognizing the fact that you know, man's interest is not served by being perpetually at war with himself for all time. People do look for ways to get along, particularly when search, uh, circumstances progress to such a point as maybe they sort of, sort of are now, uh, to where the downsides of unending division just become very much obvious and the need to sort of temper our more extreme uh, behaviors becomes more and more conspicuous, you know? So, I mean, if you just look over the arc of the history of the United States and so forth, Obviously, you know, we fought a revolutionary war for independence. We fought a civil war in the 1860s um, over an uh, extremely intractable, intractable uh, moral issue, the issue of slavery, among other things, perhaps, um, that showed us just how, you know, just how bad the consequences of extreme, you know, um, polarization, obviously it's more complicated than just political polarization, but it showed us the extremes of factional division, mm. what the uh, truly bloody consequences of that can be. But you know, you know, we could have fought a civil war in the 1960s as well, or at least we could have been in a period of time, yeah. uh, a mere, you know, a mere 50 uh, going on 60 years ago, where, and, and this was the case, where we had, uh, where we had riots and all of America's major cities. We had political violence, presidents and civil rights leaders and presidential candidates um, uh, assassinated. All of that could have 
continued in an unending sort of way. But we also had a nonviolent movement, which beyond the beyond the proximal objective, Dr. King's proximal objective of achieving equality before the law for all Americans, and of course, you know, with a focus on African Americans, but there was also this cultural movement, this sort of, you know, shift in the consciousness of American society that was catalyzed by that movement, which basically asserted this principle, which said that proper democratic discourse is rooted in a moral understanding of the fact that there is human value in each person on each side of a conversation, even if one person is very much uh, ensconced in a morally wrongheaded position and the other person happens to be advocating for perhaps a politically righteous position, it is nevertheless incumbent upon people who seek social progress to engage their opponents in a spirit of genuine love, of genuine goodwill, and of genuine empathy, because Part of what we want to do is to bring the best out of the people with whom we disagree, uh, as opposed to just pumping up the people with whom we agree. And I think that the spirit of uh, of the nonviolent philosophy had everything to do with both the political progress that was made in the 1960s and with sort of uh, providing an ethical legacy for civic discourse that anchors American society in this moment, even if we're not seeing a lot of it uh, in the mainstream conversations, but I think that there's an ethical legacy that still breathes, I guess, in the lungs of American civic discourse that, that, that gives us sort of a roadmap, roadmap back towards a more sort of enlightened way of pursuing our social differences, which I think will increasingly assert itself over the course of the coming years and even the coming, coming months, I imagine. And so, you know, we will see bad things happen in the near future. And, and uh, you know, there's all sorts of chaos ahead of us, I'm sure, with the 2020 election on the horizon. But I do think that we will be drawn to remembrance, uh, if you don't pardon me uh, saying it this way, um, of the better angels of our nature as time moves forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and as you rightly say, you know, it won't be the first time in history. I mean, I think it's worth, I, I think it's worth pointing out that maybe because we're in this uh, mm. situation now and in the memories of a lot of uh, folks who are alive today this is an extreme of tribalism and polarization um, mm. what you're kind of speaking to here a little bit is yeah but put it put it in a in um, the broader sweep of history right. it we are not off the end you know we've been mm. here before and we've been worse before um, yeah. and um, and I think also to summarize something you said at the beginning of, uh, of that kind of piece um, it's that there's no conflict between recognizing and owning our inherent self-interest. There's nothing wrong with that. And saying that yet in the long run, the long trend is it becomes increasingly enlightened. And mm-hmm. part of the increasing enlightenment of our self-interest, it's not about throwing away of our self-interest and all pretending to be altruists. It's mm-hmm. in learning that doing exactly what you're saying with respect to discourse, um, treating, you know, being able to judge ideas without judging people on the other side of the table. The better we get at that, the, the more we actually benefit. Um, because we are, uh, you know, some of us more or less, but we do all live in... Um, you know, in this one country, we are all part of one demos, mm-hmm. uh, which I think is an important word because especially, you know, I'm talking to a guy representing an organization where, you know, the two main parties or, or people who identify with the two main tribes in the democracy, um, mm-hmm. you know, we are talking about demos. We're, we're one demos, not two or yeah. many. Um, yeah. and, and maybe there are a few who want to change that, but very few. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. so, no, I, I, I hear you loud and clear on that. Well, indeed, and, to, and, and just to that, to that point about people not having to put aside their own uh, personal interests in order to embrace a more enlightened way of conducting political engagement, that, you know, that truth is reflected in the structure of Better Angels itself. So, you know, our, our members are red and blue, they are conservative and liberal and, you know, moderates and libertarians and progressives and so forth. Uh, we don't have a, you know, we don't, encourage people or push people to become moderates or centrists uh, upon better, joining better angels. Obviously, we hope that people can find common ground and ways to agree on things, but the idea is not to get people to abandon their their political identities. I mean, part of the reason why we have political identities in the first place, just putting aside the more cynical sort of 
you know, team sports aspects of it and the social dynamics of partisan affiliation. But part of the reason we have differing political affiliations to begin with is because of the fact that we have different, we have different self-interests mm -hmm. to begin with. I mean, you know, in a, in a near term sort of sense, if I'm a, if I'm a business owner or if I'm a person who, you know, uh, if, if I'm an, if I'm an investor, uh, my, you know, the, the economic policies that are going to benefit me most directly are going to be different than the policies that would benefit me most directly if I was a union member, or, you know, a labor or a federal government employee or someone like that. So, but if, having said that, if there is a culture that exists between us and sort of a philosophical conviction that says that, okay, I've got my own natural biases, I've got my own natural prejudice, and I've also got, you know, perhaps a set of, a set of interests that are going to apply to me more than they're going to apply to somebody else. Nevertheless, if we believe that in the long run, uh, society is better served by seeking the sort of optimal arrangement of governing, um, and social and political circumstances that allows for the well-being of all people to be maximized, then uh, that would that's that's a conviction that puts us in a frame of mind to look for ways in which we might discover compromises and discover arrangements that you know may require us to give a little bit in the short term so that everybody can gain in the long term, right? And there should be a, a real social satisfaction that comes from that. But that social satisfaction can only be achieved if there's a level of social trust and goodwill that exists between us in the first place. So we do at Better Angels seek to sort of cultivate that transcendent level of engaging political dialogue and to sort of restore a sense of idealism to, per, to the political practice, which, you know, perhaps ironically, also serves very much a practical purpose. Ultimately, because again, we have to be committed to this idea that, you know, uh, that in our republic, that in democratic Republican society, there is a path towards the sort of, you know, towards the common good that, again, may require some compromise on, in terms of everybody's individual piece of that, uh, but that nevertheless gives us something to aspire towards uh, in terms of elevating the outcomes of our civic uh, of our civic and political interactions and so restoring a, a culture of political engagement that's rested in the conviction that that is possible you know mm -hmm. and that the people with whom we have to interact on the other side of a conversation um, are worthy of trust and goodwill uh, in collaborating with uh, to, re to remind ourselves that this is to this is that this is possible I think inspires a bit of a inspires a spirit of recommitment to the political discourse that is fundamentally optimistic, I think. And uh, yeah, man, that's just the name of the game from where I sit. Yeah, I mean, and you said something when you were introducing the organization at the top of the show um, about how Better Angels allows people to, I, I, something like uh, kind of understand the experiences that led others to get to their own views. Mm -hmm. And I think that's super important because um, this is something I, you know, I teach in political psychology and when I do candidate training in political communication, et cetera, it's that, um, we all sincerely believe that the reason we came to our views is or are the reasons that we consciously um, use to justify our views. So when we're asked, uh, you know, why we believe something, we're liberal or conservative or whatever it may be, we roll out those, the, the arguments. And we think that we came to those views because we considered the arguments. But we know mm -hmm. that's not true. What well, right. the, the things that... Um, you know, overwhelmingly it is the case that there are a lot of subconscious and unconscious factors rooted in our experiences that cause us to end up in a certain um, maybe a, you know, political tribe uh, with a certain view on a certain issue. And then completely subconsciously, our conscious brain is induced to come up with the rationalizations post hoc. So there's the process of judgment formation, which is different from the conscious process of mm -hmm. um, justification. And, yeah. um, you know, maybe, uh, and so part, that relates to this idea that um, it's something I'm, I'm, I'm quite kind of passionate about explaining, that often our political differences are just cultural differences, if you like, subcultural differences, experiential differences that mm -hmm. we kind of post hoc rationalize. Mm -hmm. right? um, yeah. so, so I, you know, the, um, the, the, the guns example is, a, is, a, is, a, is an easy one. 
um, you know, if I've been brought up, let's say in, uh, you know, rural Alabama, um, and my dad took me to the range every, every month. Uh, and you know, that was something that I associate with, uh, you know, my father with, with good feelings, with family life. Um, mm -hmm. I saw guns held by people who were, you know, trustworthy, who used them for the right reasons, who had good values, right? That's, that's one experience of, let's say, guns and everything Second Amendment. And then on the other hand, I'm an urban progressive. I've never touched a gun, never seen a gun um, in my life. And I can't imagine what it would be like to be a human being that gets pleasure in, let's say, playing with something designed to kill people from where <laughs> I sit viscerally. Yeah. I can't, un I can't trust that person. I can't identify with that person. So I can't imagine what it must feel like to be that person. Now, really, that's a cultural gap, but it's mm. what drives the um, firm commitment to a political position. Um, yeah. And and I think so. Now, I would maybe this is a good segue into what you find in the meetings because I suspect that when you have Republicans watching Democrats talking about their views on an issue like this and vice versa, um, you know, one side gets to, as you say, um, at least see or hear the experiences, the, if you like, the cultural context that makes the political commitments of the other side a kind of a, a natural landing point for them, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So maybe, maybe even subconsciously that, bridge between political commitment and and subculture or experience mm. um, begins to get made and in mm. so doing the position of the political opponents becomes more understandable more sensible more reasonable mm. um yeah. and now I, i've kind of raised a lot of things there is that yeah, fair? Yeah. you can riff on that and um you know you know what, what is how does that sound to you as somebody doing who does what you do yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, I mean, it does tie in to the essential power of the workshop model because the workshops call upon the participants to sort of speak a language of experience as opposed to one of debate, as opposed to one of one of polemics. One of the uh, most famous uh, friendships to come out of Better Angels is between uh, two individuals who are you know now now friends of mine as well, uh, a man named Greg Smith and a man named Kriyar Mustashvi. Um, Forgive me, Kuyar, if I, if I slightly mispronounced your last name. But uh, they met at the very first Better Angels workshop that took place in South Lebanon, Ohio, after the, uh, after the 2016 election. Uh, Greg is an evangelical Trump supporter. Uh, Kuyar is a liberal Muslim who voted for Hillary Clinton. They live, uh, you know, they live in the same county. But cultural context, vastly, vastly different, you know, um, Kuyar is an immigrant from, uh, from Iran. Uh, Greg uh, was a small-town police chief uh, for some time. And Greg was a person who, you know, looked at, looked at uh, of Islam as being the religion of the enemy. I think that, uh, I, I think that he would uh, say that that's not an inaccurate way of describing his, his point of view. And so when they met at that first workshop, uh, Greg did uh, did uh, challenge or start to challenge Kuyar at a certain point. He said something to him along the lines of, "You want to know why I don't trust uh, Muslims or something like that?" He said, four, He said, "I've got four letters for you: I S I, starting to spell ISIS." And uh, Kuyar cut him off, and he said, "I already know what you're going to say." He said, "But let me tell you something: my religion has been hijacked," and that hit Greg very powerfully because Greg recalled, I guess, maybe looking at people like, you know, the Westboro Baptist Church and, and others in his own Christian faith. And he had felt that for a long time that Christianity had been hijacked in many respects by people who did not share his values. So it's not like that made, you know, made Greg perhaps a, a person who was thinking about changing his religion or that he dropped his criticisms of Islam and vice versa. But suddenly, there was a common frustration that existed between these two men that allowed Greg to look at Kuyar, a person who, uh, as he, particularly as he got to know him, he could tell was just as committed to being a kind human being as Greg was, was a person who cared about his friends, his, his, uh, his, his family, who served his community. They had all of these things in common, and religiously, you know, Greg was able to see in Kuyar, and I think Kuyar and Greg, they were able to see a common element in their piety, in their faith, Mm -hmm. even though they didn't agree on the, the, the details of these things. And so that common thread 
has sort of tied them together in a friendship, which is uh, which has allowed Greg to go and 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 visit uh, Kuyar's mosque to absorb that experience, and he's brought Kuyar to his church so he can sort of see uh, into into his world, uh, into his religious universe, and uh, it's formed the basis for for new friendship. But that's one story among many uh, that that come out of Better Angels workshops. I mean, you, you know, uh, that, sorry, I, if I may, um, yeah, 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 I think it's worth pointing out that I think that in a way that story uh, illustrates that actually, um, you know, because the political views, uh, you know, let's say uh, Greg's views about ISIS in that example, um, mm. are, uh, as a, are kind of retrofitted or, or, you know, are the justifications of the positions that come out of a feeling mm. um, right. that if you're talking about like the conclusion that comes at the end of those feelings, right? Mm -hmm. um, then you're actually talking about the thing that stops you looking at the massive stuff that is what we have in common. I mean, it's yeah. such a cliche to say we have more in common than divides us. But mm -hmm. the thing is, it's just even by talking politics um, at all, we are looking at the tiny surface layer that is so divisive when mm -hmm. there is this substrate that. Mm -hmm you know, we, it's actually easily findable. If only mm. we listen to uh, our, let's say, our political opponent, tell us why, maybe emotionally, they, they have got to what they, you know, the view they have got to. It's mm. like 90% here, there's this 10% here, but we, because we think the politics is about the 10%, we're not even looking here. But it's, but it's just a question of slightly turning our head. Mm -hmm. like, right. like, it's being in that room and you know the better angels workshop and um and starting the conversation off maybe from a different point with different vocabulary like i yes. know better angels does something that i that i actually teach which <laughs> if you've got a view um you know, don't uh, pronounce it as truth mm. it, you, use you cut me off at the past man okay you carry on man. you take over again it's uh, I, don't no, know. No, no. I mean i was just going to make that very that that very same point i mean part of the sort of inevitable arrogance of our conventional political conversations is that we are you know all of us uh or so close to all of us in the habit of articulating our political opinions as as facts as universal truth now look facts are facts are important and you know i i um i wrote a piece uh in the uh for the website uh, uh quillette that was uh entitled the problem with uh, the problem with facts not feelings which was sort of taking off of you know ben shapiro's uh, uh, uh line uh, facts don't care about care about your feelings and uh you know to just sort of make the point that you really can't communicate facts to somebody effectively unless you're able to connect with them on the level of feelings. And hence, on a fundamental level, feelings, feelings sort of matter more. But the other part of it is that data points, you may have certain empirical truths about reality, and you may have statistical facts that you can articulate about, you know, the, the the, the relevant information pertaining to the state of an economy, unemployment rates, debt, deficit, um, and all these other categories of political information that are relevant to understanding the way things work on a mechanical way. And yet, the interpretation of those facts is still highly subjective. So, you know, we have, the, we have people on both sides of the aisle who accuse the other side of not respecting facts uh, and uh, not taking data seriously. And, you know, yeah, that's, that is an issue. But when we remember the fact that there is no such thing, particularly in a political and a social context, as a fact, as an objective fact that does not then in turn need to be interpreted by a subjective human being or by a subjective human personality, well, then we're, then we're right back at sort of the starting point there where, um, you know, we need to be able to speak to, we need to be able to speak to people's emotion, emotional starting points just so we can understand how it is they are subjectively analyzing a certain yeah. uh, fact to begin with before it is before we pass judgment or, or even, being, even how, they being right or wrong. how they select facts right or or how they mm, emphasize right. facts. i mean as you're saying this so again this is great because this is this is like you know the meat and things 
I kind of sort of visualize it sometimes as, um, you know, the join the dot that you had when you were a kid, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you used to do those and you make a picture, join the dots, you make the picture, except yeah. that there are, the picture's going to be really complex and there's so <laughs> few dots. So you can actually draw, and dots are the facts, right? Mm -hmm. right, right. Political views are the, you know, the final, your, your, your world view, you know, mm -hmm. is the complex picture you're going to join to the dots. You know, and, and, and I've got this tagline, if you go to robinkerner.com, my kind of personal site, I've, I've got this tagline, which is a quote from Goethe, where he says, we see only what we know. And this, and this has been tested in the lab. And, I, and I, so I've written about this in my book too. Um, you know, this is, uh, is, is tested. It, 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 it's literally the case that there are things that we can't see if we know they're not there, even if our mm -hmm. knowledge is wrong. And vice mm -hmm. versa, there are things that we will see if we know they are there, even if they're not there, but we, yeah. you know, and, but we have this knowledge as well. So um, to your point, I think it's, you know, one of the, I think the critical aha moments in um, making this kind of progress in being able to talk to, let's, let's just say political opponents, is realizing that it's not that um, our facts determine our worldview in in like you know t this way like in a hierarchical mm -hmm. fashion but rather that it's it's an interplay one determines mm -hmm. the other that affects the other and it's an iterative process back and forth right yeah uh, and uh you mentioned uh, again before i hit record the dark you know with the dark web we mentioned that real real quick and i know you know jordan peterson um uh it's always gratifies me to hear him say uh, how perception, not only reasoning, but perception is motivated. And again, mm. this, this is well tested. And I think when we're dealing with political conflict, that is in play in spades, right? That's mm. a huge problem. Um, mm. We experience ourselves as deriving, as I say, broader uh, views from specific facts. We genuinely experience it that way, but it ain't what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Well, you know, you mentioned, um, I mean, yeah, that's absolutely true. And of course, in everything we're, we're saying, um, you know, it, it echoes the work of Jonathan Haidt, who's really yeah. sort of explored this, this dynamic of kind of emotionally motivated reasoning. Uh, Professor Haidt sits on the board of directors at Better Angels, by the way. Oh, wonderful. Um, yeah. Um, and his work has been highly influential for, for so many of us. Um, but, you know, I can... Um, uh, so much of this is important to me because it's kind of the lessons that I bring to my analysis of our social and political interactions on a macro level come from my own sort of micro sort of biographical mm -hmm. uh, experiences. I mean, you know, I, I come from a, from a biracial and multicultural family, from a family that has, I mean, you know, my, my father is a, is a conservative Trump supporter, an older white man from the South, and my mother is a liberal Democrat uh, from inner city Los Angeles. And uh, there's economic- You were born for this job. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a story to that. I ran, as a matter of fact, I, well, I kind of, I kind of made a habit of, of, uh, uh, of, of saying something like that when I was running for Congress okay. in 2014. I ran in the, the California 43rd, which is a largely inner city district, but that brings in a certain pocket of, of uh, suburban white Republicans. And so I had the same line, whether I was speaking to a black church in uh, South LA or to a white Tea Party group. Uh, in South Bay, uh, LA County. In either case, I'd say, well, people say, people ask me at the age of 26 or, uh, or 27, well, how it is that you are uh, uh, qualified to represent a district as uh, diverse and complicated as the California 43rd. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd say to them, I'd say, and my answer to that is that I have a unique background. I'd say my mother is a liberal black Democrat from inner city Los Angeles. My father is a conservative white Republican from the South. And I grew up explaining my father to my mother and my mother to my father. And that's why I think I can represent a lot of you. And it always- You were the kid who did the translation, right? Is that it what was, you're it was. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, I know. But, oh, yeah, well, and, I, and I, grew up, I grew up in precisely that sort of way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I noticed things uh, in that context about what it is that people notice themselves in terms of what's going on in so society and what's going on in our politics and what strikes people as important uh, to pay attention to. So, I mean, in more, more recent years, I can remember, now, just so you know, I live in South Central LA or South, South Los Angeles, right? inner city area, a lot of poverty. Uh, my wife, she's from the Jordan Downs projects and I lived in the Jordan Downs for about a year or so. It's the largest, uh, uh, one of the largest uh, public housing uh, communities west of the Miss Mississippi in the United States. Uh, 
and um, you know, it's it's not at all uh, uncommon in the aftermath of a of a high profile uh, shooting of an African American police shooting uh, that people in the community uh, are disturbed and talk about things. And there's this narrative and this sense that that law enforcement uh, is sort of actively gunning for for young for young black men. Um, and um, you know, we can go down the long list of those incidents and the reactions that people have to them locally. And then I can remember visiting, um, uh, as a matter of fact, and, and I, I, I feel bad because, well, this was in the aftermath of one such shooting. And then shortly following that, in the aftermath of the shooting of the police officers in Dallas by a man who, I don't know if he could call himself a Black Lives Matter activist, but there's some reason to suspect that he was, I guess, inspired by Black Lives Matter in some indirect way, maybe. But there was a man who shot and killed, a black man who shot and killed several police officers in Dallas. And I remember uh, visiting a, uh, the home of a judge in the South Bay part of LA County. And I was there with some wealthier, you know, white people who were conservatives and so forth. And uh, this was, you know, not long after both of these events had taken place. And this police shooting uh, of this, this man who I, I forget his name, but it was a shooting that it was not easy to justify. This man was sitting in the passenger seat of this car. He reached uh, for his ID in, a glove com- in his glove compartment, and he reached a little too quickly with a little too much attitude, it seemed, and he was shot by the police officer. And uh, in this setting, um, at this you know, big house that was overseeing, uh, overseeing the mountains and this beautiful panoramic view of the city, uh, with these people who I was uh, in a living room with, Folks were very, you know, very uh, and understandably uh, distraught about the the deaths of these police officers in Dallas, and there was conversations about friends of theirs who were in the department and how much they worried about their their friends in law enforcement, etc. But it just struck me how in this particular living room there was a great deal of con- con- uh, conversation about and concern for the well-being of police officers. Whereas I knew when I got, you know, when I got home to my own side of the tracks and was going to talk to people in my own community, there would be a great deal of conversation and concern for, you know, for, for the lives of people like the young man who had just been shot and killed by a police officer. Mm. Um, and yet, you know, um, not necessarily a conscious sort of consideration for people on the other sides of these tragedies. Because we grow up in particular familial and social contexts, we very naturally learn to empathize with certain groups of people over others. And I don't think that that makes us, you know, uh, uh, racist necessarily. It certainly doesn't make us consciously malevolent towards people who are outside of our immediate frame of social reference. But it does mean that we have sensitivities on the basis of our natural surroundings towards, I think, the sufferings and the struggles of certain groups of people and not others. And so, you know, you say Black Lives Matter, and that's, that's going to be insulting towards someone who feels like it's an exclusionary idea. And you say Blue Lives Matter in response to that, and suddenly you're looked at by folks on the Black Lives Matter side as taking up the cause of the oppressor in, in some way. And I guess what I, what I hope to see is a culture in which we can we can embrace a concern for, you know, for all of these groups that doesn't necessarily overlook the specific differences and the particular nuances that uh, are, that are at play uh, in the, in the struggles of different groups of people uh, at at different times. And a very important part of that, a fundamental part of that is to um, really, is to get people en masse to basically acknowledge what you've just said. So to recognize that we are all going to be naturally more disposed uh, toward concern for this group over that group. Mm -hmm. But then to accept that, to accept it as human and not to go from there to impeding Mm -hmm. integrity or intent. Right. right? And it's like, it seems to me that if we can just stop that step and that's a big, you know, it's a big just, but Mm -hmm. if we can stop that step, um, that you know, because they care more about this than this, then they are, you know, fill in the blank, right? Mm. Uh, you know, racist or to use that example or whatever. If we can stop that, then so much complication comes off the table. Mm. Um, how, 
how do we do that? Maybe, maybe, maybe the question I should ask is, how do you see that happening in the workshops that you do? Because I'm sure it does happen to some extent in the workshops you do. That's why they're successful. Mm. Uh, how, tell me about that. Well, so, I mean, the question is, how is it that you see past the the how is it that you see past the group difference to understand the particular sort of circumstance that's at play with an individual so as to empathize with them? Do, do I have that right? Well, to, to say, you know, we're naturally going to be better disposed towards this group that we identify yeah. with than that group, but mm. it does not follow from that that you are morally inferior or maybe even well, intellectually. Inter right. So the interesting thing about that is that most people don't come into workshops with the sense that they are not, sensitive to the struggles of others until they realize that there are things that they haven't thought about in the context of those conversations. So it's kind of a, I mean, you know, it's, it's my experience is that it's kind of a problem that takes care of itself in the part in the course of our getting to know one another. Because but, the and if I can just clarify, because mm -hmm. what, and what happens is mm -hmm. that you're being exposed to something yeah. that you simply right. weren't being exposed to. So you naturally apply your same basically decent instincts to this new information, this new set of experiences. And so you oh, exactly. extend what you believe into that other space. Exactly. It's, yeah. It's, people already have the tools for this. It's just that we only, typically we only get the chance to apply, you know, the, the, the toolkit of empathy, if you will, uh, in context, in our sort of ordinary social context, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when we are, we are all of us limited by the ways in which we are raise the places that we come from and also of course the information that we surround ourselves with which you know tends to be we tend to self-select our sources of information on the basis of their ability to reinforce our pre-existing biases and so forth and, you know that's just that's that the way goes back to, to that we see only what we know paradigms kind of change the data that we perceive to yes. reinforce the paradigms they're kind of sticky and have positive feedback loops all over them but when you create a bridge between groups of people on the basis of not even i was going to say shared experience but even just experiences that are similar enough even if they take place in dramatically different social or cultural contexts that allow people to be able to relate to each other across the divide between those cultural contexts, yeah. then all of a sudden people become, I think, invigorated by the process of actually sort of empathizing with what somebody is going through on the other side of this cultural sort of, uh, sort of experience. And I, I think that, that part of the reason for that is because it expands our own sense of ourselves in some way. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you know, Robin, let's just imagine that, you know, you're a person who comes from, uh, you know, you, you come from some hard scrabble urban background and I'm, you know, some, you know, some, you know, erudite British guy or something like that. Uh, and, uh, you know, might not think I have much in common with you, but, you know, in sort of coming to recognize the fact that in various ways we are both underappreciated in various ways, we both uh, have a struggle for acceptance or validation. We both have professional and personal ambitions we can relate to suddenly, you know, my concept of the human story, which might sort of disproportionately focus on people who look like me or sound like me, what have you, uh, suddenly, suddenly sort of expands to be able to make room for your story. And in so doing, your story becomes a part of mine and it becomes a part of my self-conception even. I have a friend on this side of the tracks. His experience now resonates with me. I'm able to see political issues uh, that are, you know, important to him to a degree through his eyes, right? And that is, it's kind of an empowering thing because it means that there's a whole new segment of, you know, of, of American society or maybe just sort of the human family that I now can relate to and feel a little bit more at ease with um, and uh, able to sort of understand and represent than I did than I did previously. So there's an expansion of social capital that comes alongside of a, a sort of, you know, a finer tuning of our psychological understanding of other people uh, that represents, I think, two levels of empowerment for people going into and coming out of the workshop process uh, that we've designed. Okay, so, so uh, yeah, I mean, this is, this is fantastic. I mean, I think it's worth making explicit that 
um, this works because, you know, though we might say, well, we're all human. Well, what does that mean? That's very trite. Well, what, what it actually means is we all have the same psychodynamics. If you're mm. human, you experience anger broadly for the same reasons as everyone else. Fear, broadly for the same reasons as everyone else, et cetera, et cetera. So when you tell me your story and I can see, um, which inevitably I will, why that experience you're telling me about caused you to be fearful or caused you to be angry or caused you to be outraged, right? Mm. I can't help but empathize with you, but get you. Um, mm. um, you know, and it's, uh, you know, and I, I talk about in my, in my um, you know, workshops and stuff, I talk about, you know, well, people talk about finding the common ground. Well, where is it? Well, there's layers of it. I mean, there is shared experience that you might have from someone with, say, your background, um, culturally, ethnically, whatever it may be, but more fundamentally and much more broadly and much more deeply. You know, as I say, it's these psychodynamics. It's we have the same emotional states. Mm. Um, you know, and you can look to somebody in the middle of Baghdad and that still applies, right? It doesn't mm. matter how, how wide the cultural difference is. So once you start focusing on that, you're focusing on the sameness inevitably. And, yeah. um, and, and I think uh, to your point that people become equipped. Well, yeah, they become equipped because they, they already know what all these things are. Um, mm. right? and, and, and to kind of link that up to politics, to kind of make the, the connection here. Um, and also uh, thinking of Jonathan Haidt, who you mentioned, you know, mm. about the moral dimensions. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think to a first, appro a first approximation, the unifying moral dimension, conservatives, liberals, libertarians, um, is, is the, the, the just unjust. Um, mm. And in you know, the rise of behavioral economics as a discipline, we know now, and we've tested this in the laboratory in all kinds of ways, that people will willingly pay a price. They will want to pay a price to right an injustice, even against a stranger, somebody they haven't met, a blatant yeah. injustice. And one thing that um, I've been thinking about recently is that it seems that um, an offense against a basic human sense of justice is always politically activating. Mm. And the fact, but, but people who live in different contexts, who've had broadly different experiences, um, you know, there's, let's say, you know, the urban progressive, maybe the inner city progressive, um, and the you know, Alabama farmer, um, what justice looks like and feels like to those people is gonna be very different. If mm. I'm the farmer in Alabama, um, where everybody can pretty much get by self-sufficiently, then right. justice involves, you know, not taking from one guy who worked hard to get whatever he had and giving it to someone else. But mm -hmm. if I'm in a different environment, maybe a denser environment, where I'm much more likely to suffer from, uh, because of the behaviors of others, intentional or unintentional, then justice becomes much more about having a system that protects one person from injustices that are, are caused by others, right? Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and I think that in a way that um, a deep, uh, if you like, unifying moral dimension of mm. the desire for justice versus injustice um, unites uh, all, all people all over the political spectrum, but you know, including conservatives, reds and blues, conservatives and progressives. Mm -hmm. So if you can um, tell the story across the aisle of the injustice that you reacted against, that can be very powerful mm. in, in um, in helping people see that the political other isn't really the other. Yeah, and I'm glad that you made the point in geographic terms because I mean, there's it's that's that's really probably the most under underrated variable that determines so much of our difference and understanding about things in in the first place. There's actually quite a bit of evidence. There's a man named a professor named Michael Harrington. Uh, who's written for us at, at Better Angels a bit and who has a work out elsewhere, basically demonstrating uh, what seems possibly to be the fact that geographic differences are more determinative of political and cultural differences in America than are even racial differences, right? Um, and it makes sense for precisely the reason that you've, uh, that you've described. Uh, one thing I was going to say earlier was that if there was one simple shift we could make to the way people talk about politics, related to this idea that people have a tendency to sort of talk about their opinions as being matters of, matters of fact in a very strict way. It would be, you know, continuing to have people express their opinions more or less in the way they do, but, 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 but instantiating a, a, a habit in folks where we, where we, rather than stating an opinion as a fact, say, uh, frame things by saying, 
um, I, I see things this way, you know, because um, to use the word I in framing one's political to opinion. own the subjectivity. Exactly. To own 100%, to own the subjectivity. To use the word I in framing one's political opinions uh, makes it clear on the one hand that, first of all, you are open to the possibility uh, or to the reality that your subjective experience is influencing, uh, it influences your interpretation of the facts, whatever they may be. Uh, and that, secondly, it allows a person to speak from the vantage point of their own experience so that you can open a window for the person to whom you are speaking to see what you have gone through that yields your own political point of view so that they might connect something in your biography to something in their own, right? And if we just made that simple switch from instead of, you know, always sort of throwing out arguments and claims and allegations in what we pretend to be an object manner to, as you said, owning the subjectivity in our points of view, uh, we wouldn't have to step away from the firmness of our convictions, but we would open all sorts of doors for the possibility of genuine understanding. Uh, and, um, you know, that's, that's, part of, that's part of what we uh, teach in the workshops, but that's a habit that folks everywhere can start applying right now in their political discourse. And, you know, if that was something that I had the power to, you know, snap my fingers and change on cable news and so forth, Mm -hmm. uh, today, mm -hmm. you would see a dramatic difference in the tone of American politics tomorrow. And, you know, really just as simple as that. Yeah. And, and doing that, it, you know, another way to put that, I guess, is, is that it, it stops the discussion being zero sum. It yes. allows you to accept my, uh, my opinion, my view, my experience without you having to, to kind of give me that you're wrong if yours is different, right? Yeah. We can yeah. live in that space of, it's not even tension, but of difference. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, and that, so that, again, that goes back to, to that other thing I said, I guess, earlier about, uh, you know, it enables us to judge ideas without judging people, right? We can mm. have different ideas um, w without me having to concede anything, right? To mm. accept your, your story, your, your perspective. Um, right. Yeah, I, I hear that loud and clear. So what are, what, um, is there anything that you have learned plays out in the uh, Better Angels workshop format that maybe surprised you, or maybe we just haven't really discussed on the show yet? Hmm. Is there any without, yeah, right. I mean, I had a unique experience prior to Better Angels in as much as I had sort of grown up in in with so much sort of not just cultural but viewpoint diversity and i ran a political campaign that was very much a bipartisan campaign and so forth and so i knew a little bit about what happened when you bring people with different points of view together you know in in the right circumstances you know um and so better angels has sort of given me a deeper exposure to the phenomenon of, I guess, expanding social empathy across political and cultural differences and generating relationships from that uh, in sort of a it's sort of a controlled and a systematic way. And, you know, look, it doesn't happen for everybody who steps into a workshop. There are people who walk in and they walk out and, you know, they were sort of hard, hard hearted when they came in and hard headed when they left. And, uh, you know, um, sometimes these conversations can be difficult because the emotions that people bring with them are real. The pre-existing identities people bring with them uh, are frequently, you know, firmly engraved. But as a rule, um, I guess if anything has surprised me, uh, it has been sort of just how, just how easily, I think, many people who seem a little bit intractable going into the process will find themselves sort of leaping at the chance uh, to validate something said by a person on the other side or some experience articulated by a person on the other side on the basis of the fact that out of nowhere, they're suddenly hearing a liberal say something that makes them sound like a human being instead of a pompous ass and vice versa, you know? Yeah. Uh, 
And, uh, you know, now some people come from families or live in communities where they have more cross party, uh, you know, interaction than do other people. Some people live in places where it is really, you know, uh, monolithic in terms of the political uh, and social culture, you know, so people have different starting points coming into the workshops. But, uh, but yeah, it is, uh, it is compelling to me to see just how much people want this sort of connection. Uh, and, um, you know, perhaps, um, perhaps even in particular those people who don't know that they want it until they find themselves there, you know? And um, because, I mean, that's, that's a real phenomenon. A lot of people come, come to these workshops with, for different reasons. Some people want social connection. Other people just feel like, you know, they're committed to their side, but they're concerned about, you know, the decline of the dialogue. Um, Other people are being dragged along (laughs) by a friend or a neighbor something something like that you know but i think that the feeling that a lot of people wind up have having coming out of it is that there was something they kind of they kind of feel that something that was missing in their understanding of you know of of not just politics but of people and of of their fellow americans on the other side of this thing um something that was missing was replaced and they didn't even know that it was missing in the first place you know, and, um, you know, when you discover that something that, that you've been given something that you didn't know that you were lacking, uh, it's, it's a humbling feeling, I think, um, because it shows that you had room to grow that you were not aware of. And, 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 you know, that, that's why I think that this, this pattern, and again, it's not just better angels. There are other folks doing great work in this area too. Um, but this is why I think that our culture is going to evolve in that direction because there's real psychological and sentimental rewards that come from it. In addition to the fact that it is, you know, this type of culture represents a bomb on our political division, you know? Absolutely. And yeah. And so, um, and, and I'm really inspired by it. Yeah. Okay. No, I was going to say, and on that point, um, well, I had a question before I get to that. I had a question. Uh, maybe it's an unfair question. Do you think with reasonable accuracy, you can listen to, uh, folks who come into the meeting speak for the first time and determine whether they're someone who's going to leave as hard headed as when they come in or <laughs> whether they're going to actually kind of embrace this, dare I say, spiritual opportunity that's being presented. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, that's a good question. I think that there's a, there's probably a certain extent to which you can do that. But I think it's probably more in the 50 to 60% range than it is in the 90 to 100% range. Yeah, so maybe slightly yeah. better than average, but it's not a... Yeah, I mean, you, you definitely have... And look, I'm speaking sh- sheer anecdotally. Uh, you know, maybe my colleagues would have a different answer for you. But, um, you know, I do... Yeah, I mean, you know, there are people who come in who... Some people literally literally come to try and, you know, smuggle an argument into it because it's just... <laughs> You know, they're culture warriors and they're just they're looking for the battlefield and they find out about a Better Angels workshop. It's like, oh, I got to get in there so I can show up the other it's side. Interesting. That's interesting. Let me ask you a question about that then. Sure. Would you say the people who are here, there to do that kind of subvert the, the, the project, are mm-hmm. they equally distributed politically or not? Yeah, I'd, I'd say so um, in my experience. Um, okay. Now, again, I am. Um, it, it'd be useful for me to talk to some talk to some other folks because uh, I'm. Ge- I, I've, I've participated in these workshops in different parts of the country, but mostly in Los Angeles. Mm. Um, and um, yeah, I am. Um, there's there's certainly there's certainly a phenomenon wherein a person will come in with that attitude. One of two things will happen if a person comes in with that attitude. One, they'll make the whole thing a little bit more difficult for for everybody else. I mean, it is possible for one person who's got a really bad attitude to throw a bit of a wet blanket on things. Um, even then, you can have a great workshop and just one person who's, you know, feels a little bit uh, cynical uh, sort of, you know, to themselves by the end of it. That's okay. But in other circumstances, you have people who come in looking to start a fight. And the very fact that they are so you know, I mean, simply put, so angry to begin with, sets the stage for a cathartic sort of moment 
uh, during the process where, you know, they get angry, somebody else on the other side gets angry. Uh, people get involved, they intervene, they remind each other what they're there for. Folks get the opportunity to express themselves. And then suddenly people who came to the workshop intending to hate one another leave as friends or at least with a grudging sort of respect for each other. I mean, I've, you know, I've, I've heard stories about people who have come to workshops deliberately looking to start fights who, who want to come back again and again afterwards. Um, and each time they, you know, they come back or get involved, they might want to start an argument again, but they're honestly, they're honestly available at the same time to, to hear what the, uh, what the blowhard on the other side has to say. I mean, different personality types are different. Some folks are just disagreeable, but they actually do want to, or they actually are open to finding some understanding uh, on the other side of it. You just got to fight through their defenses and they want you to do it in some sense, you know, and they're hoping that the process kind of allows for that a bit. So again, our structure isn't, you know, we, we don't set it up to, to be a debate. Um, but for instance, one, one thing that we do is one of the exercises in the workshop has to do with direct questioning. So we'll take, say you have six people on each side, red and blue. We'll take three of them, three reds, and pair them with three blues, where each red will have the opportunity to ask each blue a question about something that they think politically. And there's a moderator there helping them to frame the question, right? So in other words, if the red asks a question about abortion, and he says something like, why do you support killing innocent babies? The moderator will sort of intervene and say, okay, now let's, let's find a way to ask this question, <laughs> you know, which isn't quite so accusatory. Or if the blues says, you know, they're talking about health care, and he says something like, well, why don't you want poor people, uh, you know, uh, to have health insurance and so forth? You know, moderators there to sort of write that course. Um, but, you know, it does allow for the possibility that, that uh, you'll have contentious, contentious moments. But when you get people to settle down, when you work with them to ask the question in the right way, you know, why do you think that pro-choice policies uh, don't, uh, don't harm uh, innocent lives? Then you open the, open the window for a person to, to, to answer the question, you know, maybe with an intellectual opinion, but also potentially with a personal story, you know? Mm -hmm. um, you might have a person whose who's mother... Um, wound up being pregnant uh, too early and had the decision to terminate a pregnancy, but that allowed for that allowed for that person to come into the world at a better time in that person's life later on, or vice versa. You might have a pro-life individual who has been maybe implicitly accused of being anti-woman's rights tell a story about how he or she wouldn't be here if it weren't for the fact that their mother went against the advice of other people and chose not to terminate a pregnancy. And so, you know, the sharing of these kinds of stories doesn't necessarily, you know, equal policy agreement, but it does give people pause on each side of it frequently to sort of, sort of reckon with the human implications of the experience behind the opinion. And I know? think sometimes the power of that is that it may not change your, your policy position, but mm -hmm. it changes the nature of your commitment to it. It becomes it more humble. Mm -hmm. um, you hold yeah. it a little more lightly. You disinvest from it in terms of your ego a little bit, right? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's, you know, once you've got intellectual humility, all policy positions become inherently less divisive, less problematic. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, you know, and that's good enough. I mean, you know, that will cure what ails us if we can do that on a large enough scale. Yeah. Um, Agreed. I, I mean, you know, the thing that we forget is that, you know, it just seems to me as if everybody wants to sort of pursue this ultimate kind of political end game, where we get to a point where the other party is vanquished once and for all, and the perfect sort of political agenda is put in place, and, you know, the kingdom of heaven is ushered in, and, you know, conservatives shall reign for every, evermore, or, you know, or vice versa. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, um, that's not the way this is even supposed to work, really. <laughs> you know, uh, the process of civil improvement is, you know, it's, it's, it's a Hegelian one, really. I mean, it's one wherein you have the interplay of different ways of seeing and experiencing the world, manifesting in cultural experiences and in the interactions of groups of people who, you know, are, are never going to agree on everything, 
but who are able to inform one, of it, one another's common understanding of a complex reality that allows for progressively better and better and better outcomes to take place across society over time. That's the process we need to yeah. be invested in. You know, yeah. and that's I why mean, we and this is it. I mean, you're talking about the meta. Yeah, the solution has to be meta political, right? Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, one side doesn't completely win, and nobody of the other side ever gets born again, right? <laughs> that doesn't happen, right? Um, yeah, it can't happen. Um, and uh, and so obviously the game is to um, has to be to enable well the game to to mm -hmm. continue in a way that is well essentially civil enjoyable um you know etc cetera, etc cetera, for all of us who uh, you know are born into it um mm -hmm. and actually so, so i i've noticed that the time has gone so quick because you're brilliant and i'm loving this um we've oh, i'm just taking back and off of you man <laughs> well i appreciate that that's what i'm here for i suppose right um <laughs> but uh yeah, we've got an hour and um, yeah, maybe we're just going to have to do this again. But um, I, hey, use, I, I, use, I use that word metapolitical. So let me throw this out as a last question to you. Um, even though, as I say, I feel like we're just beginning a discussion still. Mm -hmm. um, I suspect that the, the tanker of American political dysfunction mm -hmm. begins to turn when we have... Um, a serious political candidate, maybe a presidential candidate or a senior political figure that actually explicitly takes on the fact that our political problem isn't political at all, it's metapolitical in exactly the way we've been discussing. Right. Do you think that, does that sound reasonable? Does that sound possible to you? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, do you think it might be happening anytime soon? Yeah. No, no, I mean, I think that, yeah, I absolutely think that that's going to happen. I mean, you know, the bumper sticker may not, may not say metapolitical, although I'd be pretty happy. <laughs> it won't. <laughs> I make may. bumper stickers yeah, yeah. and that one ain't on it. <laughs> <laughs> that would be pretty good, though, right? Can you imagine James Carville, you know, it's metapolitical, stupid, or something, <laughs> something like that. Um, but no, I, I, actually, to tell you the truth, I mean, I already see uh, many pundits and many politicians increasingly talking about the the issue of uh, polarization and you know and and perhaps in fits and starts trying to set a better example now it's <laughs> it's funny because there's clearly a learning curve with uh, with politicians uh, and you know naturally so because they're invested in their party structures and they got to toe the party line but you know, many of them, I think, earnestly see a problem. There, there was a Democrat and a Republican. Uh, I think they were members of Congress who were on Meet the Press. I think this was around the time of the, 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 the they, they called him the MAGA bomber, but you know, the guy who was mailing the pipe bombs mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, uh, senior Democratic uh, uh, politicians and, and, and liberal media types. And uh, <laughs> they were having this conversation about, now these are two died in the wool partisan congressmen, right? And they're having this conversation about polarization. And, and each one in turn said something to the other like this. They basically said, the conversation was like, look, we need to do a better job uh, talking to each other as Americans, treating each other with respect. We need to elevate this discourse and combat the polarization. And we could do it too if you darn Republicans weren't so, weren't so committed to being so divisive all the dang time. And, and oh yeah, we Democrats, we could probably do a better job too. And, you know, and they'd switch yeah, places. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. and I was like, I was happy with that. I was happy because I was like, well, you know what? I mean, Hey, at least they're, at least they're pivoting into the conversation, you know? And uh, I, I, I do expect that uh, we will get to a point to where we'll see candidates eventually who speak to these values and to speak, who speak to this longer kind of vision of the, the cultural and if you will, the, you know, the metapolitical progress of American society uh, with a deep understanding for the types of conversational principles and the type of culture of empathy that has to be encouraged and nourished and modeled, you know, if the United States of America is going to, reach the next sort of generation of social progress. And I, I, I do believe that it will, uh, you know, in part because I'm just surrounded by people like yourself, actually, even though you and I are just now, uh, just now meeting here virtually, but I'm surrounded by people who believe in this and who are committed to it um, as, as I am, you know, and uh, there's a future to this movement, just like there was a future to 
to the nonviolent movement that Dr. King uh, led um, back in the 50s and, and 60s. There are many people who thought that wasn't going nowhere either, you know. But here we are, a generation or two past, and uh, it has defined our view of American idealism and our understanding of equality in the United States. So, you know, we're in the midst of history, man. And the, as Dr. King said, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And I believe that. I think I do too. In fact, I think I've, I think I've agreed with everything you've said in the last hour. You know, oh, no. and I think... What I've got to say something. I've got to say something <laughs> off the walls next time. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think that, that, that last piece there, maybe it's given... Um, given us a topic for the next show, a starting off point, because as you were speaking, I was thinking that what you're talking about is the ultimate inclusiveness. Mm. Right? And maybe ironically, a lot of what is being used that, and this itself may be a political opinion and I'll own this, but I think there's a case to be made that um, a commitment to inclusiveness is at this moment being used by a large chunk of the political spectrum as the means of division. Mm. The, the you're not inclusive, you're mm -hmm. not interested in diversity is right. one of the, the, the most uh, overused um, you know, lines that's being trotted out to otherize. Mm -hmm. And I think um, if, if, in, if viewpoint diversity becomes the next, you know, the next big kind of diversity, right? Um, viewpoint inclusiveness, um, if, if you want, um, becomes, you know, if you like the, the next frontier or the last frontier of bringing people in, of, of, of unification, um, of universalism politically, then, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I don't know if and when that will be done, but in a way that's, an, that's another way of saying what the solution must be. And mm. so, and obviously I'm, I'm kind of nodding towards identity politics here, right? Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, which is, a, as I say, a big component of the divisiveness, I think. That I think a lot of people would agree mm. with that, whether they're on the left and the right. And we see identity sure. on the left and the yeah, right. Yeah, of course. And so maybe mm. that would be a great um, way. And now we've done a lot of the philosophical foundational stuff. Maybe <laughs> we should bring it a little more political next time we speak, whenever that might be. Um, oh, yeah. And I'll, well, that's something I can go all day, uh, all day long on uh, <laughs> as well. So we're just beginning, man. I'm uh, more than happy to, to, to do another one with you, man. That'd be great. All right. Well, thank you, John. Thank you so much for your time. This has been a, a genuine pleasure um, and, uh, yeah, really good. And I, I wish you well in, in your work at Better Angels. And we indeed. To, indeed. Uh, we'll get you out to a workshop, Robin. Uh, I think it's time that you come out for one. Absolutely. You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end this show <laughs> and we'll talk more about that afterwards. There you go, man. Let's set it up. Thank you.